Thank you all for being here. I'm really excited to be co hosting the Create Space Public Art Residency, um, which is part of STEPS Arts Capacity Building Program, which I coordinate on the public art team. Um, and yeah, so I'm joined here with Mike Petrain and Sherman Marge, who will speak to their experience. Um, we launched Create Space in the Call to Artists, was launched in 2020, um, with our first cohort being in 2021. Um, Charmaine was a part of, and then last year, um, Becky was a part of the 2022 residency, and this year we have um, residency ongoing. And we're going to workshop a little bit about values, um, the values of participating in residents such as these, um, as well as like some of the takeaways and why um, kind of talk centered residencies such as Green Space are important and some of Impact. So the general agenda for today, I'll go over what Create Space is, um, just to give you some context about our programming, as well as steps, if you're unfamiliar, um, some of the benefits for our residency, and then um, we'll have a Shafiq and Nick Jones presenting their experience as a part of the residency, and then we'll have some room for questions at the end. Okay, thank you. I'll make sure to speak directly to the mic. Um, yeah, so STEPS um, supports artists and communities in transforming public spaces, in surviving places by creating public art plans, installations, and great engagement strategies. Um, we really believe that we can challenge systemic inequities by fostering vibrant places um, through this artist capacity building programming. Um, part of our vision at STEPS is that public art has the ability to change these um, inequities um, on a need to have for all public spaces and by reflecting the diversity of communities that host it. We also empower all of our residents and artists alike um, involved in all of our programming to be empowered um, in ownership in public space and also challenge the assumptions around the world and the people that we share it with. A huge component of the residency as well is to really have genuine community engagement at every opportunity, um, to really build that capacity for underrepresented artists and showcase the power of public art to reimagine equitably designed cities. So Create Space, when we start Create Space and launch in 2020, the program's aim was to support individual artists in their pursuit of public art practices. Um, it's in aims to strengthen solidarities amongst artists across the country. It is a national residency, um, which works in diverse contexts to build connections between artists and their communities, and also encouraging conversations on equity, um, city building design, and placemaking, which we've been talking a little bit about today with the first panel and the keynote, um, all about equity and diversity and inclusion. Some of our themes um, and approaches to public art include um, identity, so engaging with individual concepts of identity and how these intersections can form and be represented in public art. Um, as well, again, as community, um, really fostering that community engagement at every level and um, ensuring equitable approaches to public artworks, exploring case studies and learning from artists um, on how to better engage um, and empower community um, as a part of their public art projects um, and accessibility, um, exploring themes of public versus private spaces, um, who is seen, who has access, and how can public art transform this conversation and of course, land and our connection to it, um, relationships through indigenous and cross-disciplinary lenses. What does it mean to create public art? How does a site and history inform or direct the final work? So some of the things that Create Space Public Art Residency offers are skill building opportunities uh, with behind the scenes visits of artist studio fabricators and production, as well as um, a plethora of skill building workshops, which we have amended year to year based on feedback from the residents, as well as an advisory panel that we um, lean on for our programming 
um, and then network and mentorship. So um, we really are keen on peer-to-peer -peer learning as a part of our residency and really fostering those relationships across um, artists within the cohort, um, as well as um, being able to provide um, professional development skills through um, mentorship and opportunities to engage with local and national communities throughout all of these opportunities. Um, public art portfolio building, um, so funded opportunities, of course, to create this public artwork in their communities, as well as support and coaching from both step staff um, and artistic advisors in the concept development stage, as well as like the full-on project including fabrication, um, and then audience development where we support with the documentation, storytelling, and promotional support of the public art projects created as a part of the residency. And then, of course, financial um, professional support where each resident is provided with an honorarium, a material budget, and documentation support. Um, and additional opportunities um, include just requests for um, letters of support, um, support with looking for additional funding, whether that's in terms of grants um, or otherwise. Um, one thing I'm also really proud of with the Create Space program is that with STEPS, we really like to encourage um, ongoing relationships. So right now we're still working with Megan on some other projects and um, Charmaine is actually part of our advisory panel for this year's residency. So really want to ensure this is not just like a one-off relationship or if you're part of this residency, um, but we really want to include um, real um, connection um, as a part of this programming. And um, yeah, so um, we really are keen on just making sure that it's genuine. As I mentioned, um, we have a mentorship program as well. The first year, we had a one-on-one -on -one model where each resident, so each year has 10 resident resident groups in total um, that are um, a part of the residency. And the first year we had each resident matched up with the mentor. <laughs> Last year, we switched to a cohort model where we had three um, mentors across Canada from diverse backgrounds, all equally support all 10 of the residents, resident groups. And then this year, we went back to a mentorship one-on-one -on -one model. Um, we also are supported by various partners um, as a part of Create Space, including Richmond Art Gallery, um, um, Edmonton Arts Council, and furthermore, to help realize some of these public art projects um, in different cities across Canada, and um, as well as our advisory panel, as I mentioned, um, really to ensure that we take in diverse voices. Um, from a variety of different backgrounds, um, not just um, culturally, but also geographically, as we are a national residency and we understand the challenge of representation um, in rural areas, um, up north, where sometimes it's a little bit more difficult to engage, especially with a primarily virtual residency, um, the challenges of internet connection and things like that. So just trying to mitigate any foreseeable problems in the future, we really like to engage with um, these advisors to give us more insight on how to improve our program. Um, and then some workshops that we include, um, we've kind of really tried to engage more with what is most important to the residents each year going on. Um, so we really um, lead on like their feedback, both from the year prior, as well as starting off with a forum that we share with all of our residents to ask them what they're looking to gain from the residency and try to cater our program accordingly. Um, so some of the talks that we've had are reimagining community engagement, um, defining digital media. We just recently, as a part of this year's um, public art residency, had a mentorship in the arts panel talk, um, addressing just um, how to make the best out of mentorship 
um, opportunities, both from a mentee and a mentor perspective. Um, we also have some practical Ooh. workshops that we um, provide, including public art application with Eventscape, which we've had each year, um, as it's something that we find very valuable for all of the residents and continues to be um, really appreciated. So it's ongoing, as well as creating and managing a public art budget um, hosted by artists Quentin and Javid. Um, another great thing about the public art residency that I'm really um, excited about and happy that we are moving forward with are some real life opportunities to um, respond to call to artists. So in our first year, we had an opportunity with Queen's University um, who actually reached out to us in hopes of um, having an artist from specifically and exclusively the residency um, pitch an idea for a mural. Um, so just a call to artists, a specific um, create space opportunity competition that all residents were equally um, able to apply to um, and also be compensated for their ideas and then got shortlisted and um, had one final winner um, be able to actually create a project for this opportunity. And then last year we partnered with Summer Moon Festival in Sault Ste. Marie um, and similar concept where just some real life opportunities for the residents to further their practices and develop their um, portfolio. So that's been really great that we're able to continue with these opportunities that were not initially in the ideas of create space, but it's nice to encourage um, more opportunities for our artists. Um, we've had a, an amazing set of artists and residents. I was going to showcase all of the residents. Unfortunately, I'm unable to. Maybe I'll show you after because um, when we get to our takeaways, I will turn my laptop around so everyone is able to witness their incredible work and projects that they created as a part of Create Space Public Art Residency. Um, but yeah, so without further ado, I'm going to pass it off to Charmaine Merch to introduce herself and um, speak a little bit about her experience. Thank you. So yeah, thank you for inviting me to uh, talk a little bit about my experience with STEPS. I'm going to go right into it. Um, you spoke about um, continuing collaboration, and I really, I really think that's been of such value to me. And because you know, oftentimes in a residency or in a, any kind of work, you you end, you finish, and that's it. But I feel very um, comfortable in calling with questions and you know continuing the relationship. So thank you so much. Um, for the residency, I created a work called I Am Lucy, I Am Thornton, and it's a installation that is on the property of a Toronto District School Board um, uh, school downtown, uh, Eastern and near the distillery, if you know the distillery at all. And there were many great things and huge challenging challenges with working with the school board because you can imagine the amount of permits and um, and it was during COVID, so there were many, were many delays. And it actually, so I started in 2021 and it got installed uh, Two weeks ago. <laughs> so if you're interested in public art, I would say you have to have a great deal of patience and allow for many, many changes. It also got installed incorrectly. So um, it is, don't have the image, but it's a simple, it looks like a signpost, but really um, it's a doorway. So I have two rectangular posts are doorways. They're actually the right size in the way that they're the doorways of an 1830s Toronto house, 
but I had to contend with safety and people hanging off it. So I imagined it as eight feet high and they installed most of it underground, which in a way is fitting because it, so I've had to rationalize it. It's about a dig on the spot, on that very spot of an 1837 house they found or remnants of a house, pottery and bits of you know, uh, things to suggest that there was a stable. And it was the house of, entrepreneurs and city builders, Thornton and Lucy Blackburn. That's why it's called I Am Thornton, I Am Lucy. And um, in 1985, uh, a group of students and historians were doing a kind of archeological dig on the site, just, just trying to learn about archeology. span And they discovered really what um, came, came to be known as a site of the first underground railway stop the home of Thornton and Lucy who um, were enslaved in the United States, escaped to um, Detroit. The Detroit riots um, were based on their stories. They escaped again to Toronto. Um, it was York then and, um, and started uh, and built a house and started the first taxi business in Toronto. And they, it was known as the cab and the TTC colors were based on their taxi. So they're um, now known as, um, as important um, city builders and people that contri contribute to the fabric of Canada. So from this small day uh, came this great story and I really wanted to tell about these black entrepreneurs and the other uh, groups of black people that came to Canada and did great work that um, it became buried. So hence the rationalization that most of the pole is buried unintentionally, but there's something, something to that. So um, it was a huge project. I imagine it um, in a different way. Um, the post being installed, but also doing an augmented reality piece that brought a 3D house um, image, uh, an image of a 3D um, construction to the site. And, you know, when you're going about public art, uh, budgets are really important. And I did right away for a grant because um, STEP supports that process. Um, but it still wasn't quite enough to cover, cover the, the amount I received to do that augmentation. So I, um, I pivoted because we had that year to produce a project and everything was delayed. So I, I did, um, I call it performing landscape. So I did a performance on the site. I told the people that came what I had planned. And then I actually um, called it, I am Lucy, I'm Thornton and spoke as kind of Lucy Blackburn, telling about the past, telling about my encounters and telling about the future. So just trying to um, uh, imagine past, present, and future all together in that space. And um, lots of learning, you know, always, I called it, um, well, we, in the performance, we had, we, we wrote um, our home on this land. So talking about whose land, where we're standing, and also in public art, imagining you know, what you put out might not be taken in good light later on. So really careful about our intention, what we're putting out, and with all of the conversations about monument, being really thoughtful in, in what we are as artists, what we create and what we place. So that, that um, those archway doorways now are um, semi-permanent. I would say they they will stay up for a while. And um, one wonderful thing that happened, I worked with because I'm arts educator as well. I worked with the students, and um, they created. There's a new building going up across the street, and so they were able to learn about the Blackburns, and the um, the builders allowed them to put the story of the whole neighborhood, including the Blackburns, up on the hoarding. So it moved that way and then now they're building a new fence around the school and they've asked um, 
need to work with the students to build in the story of Thornton and Lucy Blackburn. And so it really is a project that, you know, is ongoing and, um, and quite wonderful. So I wanted to just thank you for, you know, helping me um, think about it and to support me during all of the changes and then to, to, um, to see it come, even though it's not my full vision to some sort of fruition and, um, and, and able to really mark or place, do a real placemaking and spot and for people to come and learn about the black birds. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I also encourage you to go to the board. There's kind of a space just if you want to uh, take a closer look at some of the images. Can you go back to it? Yeah, for sure. Oh, that yeah. 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 Ye
Uh, you, you learn it, you do your best, you interpret it, you try to make it as expressive as possible, and then you're done with it, and it's somebody else's project. So with creative technology, I was able to like form my own ideas and um, kind of take responsibility and control of my own creative process, which I really, really loved. And I, I also got to imagine these large scale installations that combine music, which I already knew how to do, with something completely different in the visuals and the technology aspect of that installation. So I started trying to create uh, these installations that I was imagining. And I, after trying to do that for a while, I started submitting my ideas uh, to public art calls. And I, through that process, and through the process of actually going through and being successful at a couple, I realized that everything I knew about the music industry and that I had learned from the years spending there uh, seemed to be absolutely useless in public art. And unlike my music education, I actually taught myself everything I know about creative technology. So I learned to code by myself. Um, I learned about computer software programs, all the hardware like sensors, LED lights, projectors, screens, Arduinos. And though I, I studied it fairly intensely, I still lacked that uh, community that you get from school when um, you're in an educational uh, environment. And I really had no network uh, that I could turn to for help when it came to these public art calls. Um, so, and I found that there's really no uh, guide, like there's, there's no site you can go to that says here's what to do and here's what to expect. There's, in terms of the application process, there's a lot of terminology like RFPs and RFAs and expressions of interest, uh, which I did not know about. Um, you have to know what kind of renderings and sketches to provide. Uh, you have to build a budget and not knowing that you also have to account for permits and insurance and engineers who may have to sign off on your design. It's really hard to build a budget when you don't know all the pieces that have to go into it. And um, I've actually had an installation that had to be taken down literally the next day after I installed it because I was unaware of um, some electrical standard codes that I had to adhere to. And despite a lot of communication with the organization that I uh, was putting up the installation for, it went up, I just communicated with the BIA, they promoted the installation, and they made sure that the artwork lived in the community in a thoughtful and meaningful way. And this is just to name a few of the things that they helped me with. And as someone who knew very little about the public art process, that project and the residency definitely fast-tracked my learning and gave me confidence now that I'm applying to future opportunities. So really the opportunity to speak with those that I would not normally have known to contact or have had access to uh, and expand my network of people in the public art world made this, made this residency very, very valuable to me. Uh, and this expansion of community um, and all the information I received uh, gave me a, a big boost of confidence. And be, that happened because they gave me practical skills and practical tools that I could use straight away in my projects. And I know that they, every year, get better and better. They consistently ask for artist feedback, and as well as the advisory council. And I know that, as Melinda said, this year they're revamping their entire mentorship um, structure to, based on the feedback that they were given. And um, I think also BIPOC residencies like this encourage artistic creations by all sorts of people of all backgrounds. And it lets us know that our voices matter and it, we should, should be heard. Um, and it, this residency, it gave me confidence that my voice is actually worthy of being heard. And I think that idea of worthiness can either, it's the difference between an artist quitting or an artist keeping going. And for me, the participation in the residency helped me keep going and actually resulted in my next project. And as Belinda mentioned, uh, Steph is uh, still supporting me, which is great. Um, one day during the residency, I contacted Colin from Steps and I was asking him about another public uh, art project idea I was 
thinking of doing, and but I was having a lot of doubts about. And he enthusiastically offered steps, uh, service, and support. And I am I'm just very grateful that the um, the people I met in the residency uh, are not only knowledgeable, are very knowledgeable about the public art world, but also they're willing to support emerging artists. And now I get to create my first permanent art installation called Birdsong. Um, and I get to uh, design an interactive light and sound sculpture that will be housed on the side of the building in the Uptown Young PIA. And again, Steps is helping me through all stages of the process. And I'm, again, very grateful that there is an organization like Steps uh, and the Create Space Residency who will help emerging artists like myself navigate the public art world and um, help us artists bring our big ideas to life. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I'm very intrigued by your um, journey because I'm personally really I'm someone who's very um, wears a lot of hats. I'm interested in different um, art forms, and I've been um, more interested in immersive, interactive um, installation and installations and things that involve um, people's sensory experiences and mind experiences and how this can also shape society and um, when people in cities interact with these things, how does that minorly or majorly change people's day or change people's perspective on things. So I'm very intrigued by your idea and I'm, I'm, I'm curious to know more about your new installation as well. Um, but I was just wondering, I have two questions. So. First is, what was that transition like from being a violinist to um, being in interested in public art? What was that inspiration? And also, um, like when you were building a public art that can be interactive, where people can touch it and feel it and things like that, how do you um, consider like the damages that could happen and, and things like that? Sure. So the the transition from going from being a musician into like more interactive technology based art, it took a very long time. Uh, but I think right away I was very I was really into it. So it, it took a, a long time for me to even figure out what I can use uh, in terms of like software programs um, or even like the hardware, what it is I wanted to use, and it, it took like years of figuring out uh, like a starting point in terms of the software. So I, I mainly use Touch Designer. So when I kind of heard about Touch Designer um, and figured that that is a great um, software to use for interactive art, I then had to spend years learning it. And it was years, it's a steep learning curve. But again, it was something I was so interested in that I it was kind of fun. There was a lot of tutorials and a lot of workshops that I uh, watched, but yeah, it, every step of the way, it felt very creative. Um, and I still play violin and I get to use my music in my uh, installations as well. So it, it didn't feel like a true departure from violin, but it definitely felt more creative. But it, it, it took me quite a while. And from hearing other people's stories who have done this as well, it takes, it takes some time to get used to um, Technology, especially coming from like an acoustic instrument. Yeah. And I have a question about the residency and the mentorship. Like, is it something, do you have to have an idea to propose for the mentorship? Or like, um, is it more about the vision of the artist that you're you know, interested in? Like, I'm not, I never heard of this mentorship and residency. I'm very interested in Yeah, so. no, that's, that's the whole point. So, yeah, thank you for asking that question. Um, we don't ask for a fully conceptualized like concept or idea to be um, in the application. Um, we do ask if you have an idea, um, but the selection process, we also do lean on a selection committee, which is also made up of um, three diverse artists from various cultural backgrounds and also different regions in Canada to be representative. Um, but we look into a variety of different factors, including, um, of course, because it's BIPOC focused, 
um, your cultural background, as well as if the residency will um, be valuable to the resident as well, um, as it's posed as a um, residency for emerging artists. Um, but as we've kind of already spoke to, that can um, vary um, depending on um, how emerging arts public art. Since this is a public art um, residency, um, artists from all different um, mediums and different artistic backgrounds can apply with their ideas and experience and may not be as familiar with public art. And we can definitely support with our expertise in um, kind of fostering um, that, um, yeah, artist capacity for them. Um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. So. I don't need a microphone, I promise. Um, I have a question as well. You mentioned earlier, Belinda, when you were talking about bringing the artist on, you asked them to fill out a form about what they're hoping to get out of the experience. And that's a new idea to me as someone who works with artists. Is that something you've seen done elsewhere? What do you ask them and what types of answers do you get? Yeah, um, as Megan uh, mentioned, it like has grown with the residency. Um, so we kind of build on each year and kind of see the sorts of, um, we also, so we do feedback intake at the beginning of the residency once the cohort has been selected. So with just the 10 artists, um, resident, resident groups that are selected, we send them an intake survey um, of what they would like to, um, yeah, gain from their participation in the residency. But as well, at the end of the residency, we also do an evaluation. Um, just about their experience, what worked, what didn't work, and we use a lot of that information as well into the next year to kind of guide, okay, so this mentorship model may have worked for some residents but not for others. What are better ways for us to support all residents equally? What are better ways to ensure um, each resident feels supported by their mentor and feels like they can see themselves maybe in their mentor? Would it work better for them to be matched up with someone that they give us a name or a recommendation for, things like that? Um, so it kind of builds. I wouldn't necessarily say it's something I've seen before because even for our organization, it's something we're still like kind of learning and working on each year to improve um, because we really want to ensure all the residents feel um, supported and that, yeah, they gain the most that they possibly can and they get the most, um, yeah, significant experience um, as a part of their participation. And can you recall what types of answers you get, specifically for artists who have come with a concept in mind? Yeah, they also vary. Um, it varies on the question and it varies on the resident. Um, one of the questions that we have are the kind of workshops that they would like to see. And there are quite a few residents who ask about um, grant writing workshops. Um, and there are some residents who are more um, keen on just having talks um, from a variety of different artists um, across the country that they could engage with. Um, so we try to really find a middle ground and ensure that we can find something that works for everyone. Um, again, because we are really trying to encourage um, real connection with all of our artists. Um, we're also open to resource sharing. So if we don't necessarily have a grant writing workshop, we're definitely open to sharing resources on upcoming grants, supporting with grants, things like that. Yeah. Where can we follow your work? <laughs> Well, if you look up steps, you will they have a lot of information on us. <laughs> that might be the easiest way, but Google or Google my name anyways, it probably is. I don't know what would happen when they go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so yeah, that's all mine. And thank you. I don't want to encourage any um, mature artists. We are artists and we're forever emerging. And it was really wonderful because I have made many. I, I do sculpture and painting, and I'm an arts educator. And so I come with a, um, a certain background and experience. And I wasn't sure when I applied to public art, which was new and emerging for me, that they would accept me. But they were very open to that. So yeah, apply. Whatever. Come with what you have and who you are. And I really would 
was thankful for that because I I had a lot of learning and a lot of questions. You could really see um, the need and the emergence of whatever whatever you however you are and however you come. Hi, thank you so much again for sharing uh, such insightful thoughts and your words and um, your experience as well. Um, I have two questions for Megan. Um, so the first question I have is, I know you shared that it took you a while to like know the organizations, find the resources, and uh, and sometimes you know you um, connect with an organization, but it turns out that it, like it doesn't align with your values or your personal mandate. I feel like um, you know as emerging artists and designers, it's very difficult to find those industry connections, and you know especially if you have not, not attended like an institution uh, that, is, that focuses specifically on art and design. Um, so I was just wondering if there are any tips or advice that you'd like to share with us on how we can like, how to better streamline that process. Like what are some things that we need to like think about or be mindful about when it comes to our artistic practice and journey. And the second question I have is, as someone who was a recent graduate from OCAD, I've seen my last year of education that there was like a real, real fear among artists and designers and uh, when it came to the emergence of AI technology. Um, so I'm just wondering as someone who worked with creative technology a lot, what are your thoughts? Thank you. Those are the questions. Um, so your first question was uh, in terms of like networking. Um, what I found and I don't know if this is the case for all artistic mediums, um, but with creative technology, I found that people in it, this, and especially in Toronto, ha are very open and supportive. And I think that it has to do with um, kind of the nature of coding and how everything is, built. so much of it is open source and people are very willing to share. So I, um, I, I can't remember, but like if I met one person, through a, like going to a conference and I contacted them, they would be more than willing to like grab a coffee with me and uh, kind of chat with me. Um, and just, and I know like that's probably what everybody says, but by doing that, it kind of slowly expanded um, who I knew and who, if they couldn't do a gig, may refer me. And I actually got a, quite a few gigs starting out like that. Um, and um, yeah, just like I, and again, this is another probably cliche thing. I said yes to everything and I'm still saying yes to everything. And that may mean that I do gigs that like don't, I don't actually, I realize I don't like that much and I don't want to do this, but at least I get to meet people and figure out that that is something that may not be of interest to me. Um, so just being very, open and saying yes to a lot for a while until you can kind of get established and say no to the things you don't want. I found that worked for me. Uh, and I don't know if you want to, if you have other advice, you probably know much more than me, but. Um, yeah, the networking is really great. And I just want to um, reiterate what you said about it's a, um, across Canada. So it was really wonderful to connect with artists in different areas because most people were siloed here um, and they were very helpful. Um, I am actually working with two of those artists from my cohort um, building a new project. And what was the other one? AI. Oh, <laughs> yes, AI. Um, so I, I mean, I worked with a little uh, Jabby Jaw, who was a mentor for me. And he's not directly with AI, but um, just creating, trying at first to create that um, three dimensional imaging in that space. I had to talk to a lot of um, uh, people involved in AI, and it didn't quite work, but I they were, as you said, very open to working with me. And I work with a lot of, I work with similar to you, I work with musicians and um, performers and uh, poets. I think public art really um, has that opportunity to connect to so many different areas. And, and 
and dry aging. You can dry aging work. So I was able to do the performing landscapes with a lot of um, support and um, and including sound and, and and a lot of things. So I really um, just not just AI, but all of the different resources and things that you can draw to make a really rich, to build a really rich project. Because public art really holds that and step, steps encourages that. Thank you. Oh, one more question? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, are there any more audience questions? No. Um, I think maybe I'll just post one more question for both of you um, before we wrap up, and that's kind of just, um, I feel like we've probably touched on this already, but just like really the last thing you want to elaborate on um, with regards to the benefits of the Canadian Arts Council and like the focus residencies um, and the importance of them. Um, and why this work shakes us. So, yeah, focusing on BIPOC residents brings such, adds to the voices, brings such variety and um, different stories into the space. It has allowed me to sort of tell the story of this couple, which I think resonates. We all take public transportation or take taxis of some sort, Uber, and to know that this couple kind of in Toronto in 83rd started that. You know, just and, and to be able to have my voice heard about that. And, and, and to be invited to the table and then to be able to share that story again and again in many different arenas. Um, all starts with giving um, giving many people voices, like making space for uh, new stories. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, I think for me it was, I'm not going to say this well at all, but um, I think being half like mixed Asian, I wasn't even sure I qualified for a BIPOC residency. And I saw pictures like from previous years um, that like there were other kind of people who look like me in there and I, I felt like okay I can apply to this um, and yeah it's um I think it's it definitely made me think more about uh, my own artistic practice and I guess kind of like how my my cultures and my background factors into the art that I make um, and my I my art as far as I know, it doesn't really focus on my heritage, but I'm sure like somehow it's deep in there. Uh, but I, I appreciated that there were other people who uh, looked like me in the residency and uh, had similar artistic and cultural background. And I, it just felt uh, comfortable to be in that uh, environment and more creative that way too. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think we're due for time, but thank you all so much for having us.